back two, three days ago. And it all started for me at the third International Biochar Conference in Rio de Janeiro in mid-September. And that was something that my organization was involved in organizing. And um, it was a great conference. A lot of wonderful presentations. I don't remember any of them because it was a complete blur for me. Some, people, some of you here were there. Uh, we were on the beach in Rio de Janeiro, and I think I spent a total of maybe 45 minutes on the beach. <laughs> so basically, it was a conference. It could have been anywhere, and it was a great conference, but it did get me a plane ticket to Brazil. And I think for a lot of us, what we were really looking forward to was the field trip after the conference. And uh, so I did a number of things in my, in my month there. The first was a field trip with a lot of other people, including some of you here, to um, Manaus on the Amazon River to see some terra sites. And then the second, my second stop was in Acre State, in the, mainly in the town of Rio Branco. Um, that is way in the, pretty much at the end of the road in the Amazon on the uh, Bolivian and Peruvian border. And when I, at, when I was in Acre, I did a few excursions. I went to Fortaleza, which is a religious community and nature retreat center. Um, I got to see geoglyphs, which are 3,000-year-old earthworks uh, that were made at a time when people think it might have actually been savanna in this region. There's evidence that it was not forested when humans made these earthworks. I learned about the heritage of Chico Mendez and how important that is for the politics and sociology and development issues in the state of Acre. And I got to make some presentations on biochar to uh, a lot of the NGOs and state agencies in Acre. It was a very interesting experience. So starting with the field trip uh, to the to the Terracreta sites, um, we got to ride on this lovely Amazon River boat. And here are some of our friends, some pictures that I took. There's Jay. Where's Jay? Right here. Um, Enjoying a caprinha, I think, was our drink of choice on the deck on our boat, and then um, sitting in a very hot, steamy, humid rainforest. And there's Paul and his friend Anna, Anne, Anna, Anna, uh, Anna. And then um, again in the same hot, steamy rainforest, braving piranhas and leeches and who knows what all, cooling off in a creek. So it was, a, it was a great adventure. And here's what we actually saw. Uh, we went visited a little village on the banks of the Rio Solomois, which is a branch of the Amazon. Uh, it's called the Costa de la Rajal, the Coast of Oranges. And there are some small farms there, and they're typically uh, 100 meters wide, facing the riverfront, and they go back uh, somewhat less than a kilometer. So there's little slices along the riverfront. And on the very highest part, the bluff there, you see, is where the terra soils are. And so these are the areas that were continuously ha inhabited for thousands of years, and where people put charcoal in the soil over as much as 6,000 years or even more, and built up these tremendous soils. Um, you can see here a soil profile going down to, this is 80 centimeters. So it's very thick and dark, up to 80 centimeters. Now, the, the high areas that don't get flooded is where these are concentrated. These farms slope down into the backwater areas where, the, where they get periodically flooded. Oh, and by the way, that there is a piece of ceramic. It's everywhere. It's no exaggeration. I could just walk along the ground in the Tarpeta areas, scuff my foot, and a piece of pottery would show up. So here, here's what it looks like on the ground. There's really a big difference between the Tepreta soil and the native soils in the Amazon. And one, one really, uh, somebody asked a really important question during our tour. They said, What's, what does this Tepreta farmland sell for as compared to farmland that's just on the native soils? And we were told it's five to six times, uh, goes, the selling price is five to six times higher. So that's a real clear indication of the value of these Tepreta soils to today's farmers. So we were um, hosted by several Brazilian agencies on this tour. INPA is one of the agencies that helps small farmers, and Dr. Newton Falcon <coughs> is um, 
working on with these farmers to help optimize their agricultural production on the Preta soils. And he's also working with them to um, test different uh, combinations of fertilizer and biochar on the less on the, on the lighter soils that don't have as much charcoal. The objective here is not to, you know, kind of recreate what the Indians did, but to use a modern biochar and, and as a combination of one of many agricultural techniques to <coughs> stabilize their production and get them to move away from slash and burn. <coughs> Um, but in the backwater areas that I was talking about that slope down from the high bluffs are uh, uh, typically fish ponds. Um, and you can see how orange and red the soil is. It's not dark. But the fish ponds are, are uh, definitely a very economic thing for these small farmers and they're also a source of nutrients. So, you know, similar to the way that we think the terra soils were built up in antiquity where people used fish waste and um, and other sources of, of manure and um, kitchen waste and whatnot to fertilize those soils. Today, these farmers on these same sites have access to fish waste from that production. So that was the first day of our trip. The second day of our trip, we went uh, further back down the river toward Manaus to visit an, an Embrapa field station. Embrapa is the agency that's similar to the USDA here. And there they are just doing some basic research and characterizing what these terra preta soils are really all about. And they find tremendous variety. The map there shows you this one site that's at probably about 20 hectares. And the darker areas are where the terra preta is. The lighter areas are where the native soils are. And then there's a lot of intermediate areas, which they typically call terra mulata. And so here's a couple of different sites. Um, the, uh, the number two there, Terpreta, is on the, what, what they call Campo, which is, it's underneath an area that was, was farmed in recent times. And the one, number four, is, uh, is actually the, the native Latisol. And you can see it also looks a little dark at the top. But that's not from biochar, that's just from soil weathering. And you can see also in this soil, maybe not because the, the, it's hard to see these slides, but there are a lot of little um, kind of depressions in that soil, and that's where the pottery shards are. And so that was really instructive to actually be in those pits and experience them, put our hands on the stuff, and was great and so afterwards we motored back to Manaus and saw things like the meeting of the river Solomais and Rio Negro where there's two different kinds of water from different geological conditions. Um, we saw this bridge that they're building across the Amazon at Manaus that is really scary to a lot of people because it's really going to open up development. Wherever there's roads in the Amazon development and deforestation, and it's a beautiful sunset. So my next stop was to Rio Branco um, in the state of Acre, and I was there to visit an old friend of mine named Lou Gold, and some of you know Lou. Um, and this is his little hammock and, uh, and his little um, house that he has out in Fortaleza. And for any of you who, do, who have ever heard of Lou Gold, he was sort of the man on the mountain uh, Bald Mountain in the Siskiyou National Forest. Lou and I worked together for 12 years, saving the ancient forest, and you can see his license plate there, it says Bald Mountain. So some of you will really appreciate that picture. And this is what Lou does today. He's, he's quite the blogger. He's an American in Brazil. He's emigrated there. He's been there for about eight years. And he writes a really wonderful blog about social and environmental and cultural issues in Brazil. So I encourage you to check out his blog. And this is Rio Branco. You know, I was ex I, I was kind of expecting something a little more primitive. <laughs> but there's, you know, concrete. It's a quite the built environment, 250,000 people. There's car dealerships. There's probably more motorcycles than cars. Um, and there's even a rotary club. It's a city. 
Are those motorcycles and those alcohol driven or the control? I don't think so. They don't they use a lot of alcohol in Rio Branco, even though there's one alcohol plant, which is, I'll show you right here, that is an alcohol plant in the lower right. But they don't use that much pure alcohol there. Most of their is comes in, it's imported by up the river on, on boats. Blend 20% yeah, I'm the sure they blend it. I'm sure they blend it, but I don't think they need much pure alcohol. So this is, you know, out in a, within a 50 mile radius of Rio Branco, this is mostly what you see. You see some log trucks. You see a lot of smoke. I mean, they're, everything's burning all the time. And this was at the end of the dry season, so it was very, very smoky all the time. Um, this this here is a, a big cattle ranch. And you see there's a nice big house there. That's a rich cattle rancher. These are the people who really drove the deforestation in this region. This is a Brazil nut tree. You see these all over the place, these giant remnant trees. And the reason they're there is because it's illegal to cut a Brazil nut tree. So they'll cut every other tree and leave a Brazil nut tree, but they don't tend to live. You know, you can see that one's dying. So you see a lot of these giant snags. Because when they're isolated from the other trees and they lose their pollinators, they just don't survive. And this is the reason, cows. And it's both the large ranchers and also the small holders. If, if you're a poor person in Brazil, the easiest way you can get some money is to get a hold of a couple of cows and a place to graze them. It's not much work and it's a, it's, it's a source of income. So I was really grateful when I finally got to a place where I could actually be in a piece of forest. And this is at Fortaleza, the community where my friend Lou has a cabin. And that is one darn big tree. And so I got to spend a, a, a couple of days wandering around and taking pictures and seeing amazing rainforest species and butterflies. And and uh, going on a river trip in this dugout canoe with the family that lives there. That was quite the experience. And I started looking around this community where they're, they're not doing cows. They're trying to do something different here that's more of a sort of permaculture farm, like what a lot of us are trying to do. So they have a garden ready bed. That's manioc there. And over on the right, you can see clearing a little area and we're going to start a little papaya plantation. And on the lower right is a ceramic kiln that was part of one idea they had about a way to make money was to make pottery. And I'm looking at it and saying, you can make biochar in this. <laughs> and so this is the way more where people are living. Development is coming to this area big time in the form of rural electrification. People are now being able to afford appliances. TVs, refrigerators, you know, things are simple, but they're very nice, you know, but people are having a comfortable standard of living, and that's good. Um, and the, the government and the agencies are, are helping this happen. Um, so, for instance, five years ago, this community had no electricity, now it does. And state programs that are supporting small farmers are doing things like providing a low-cost loan for this tractor. However, you know, when I asked my friend Louie about it, he said, well, he was against them getting the wall for this tractor because row crops are, nobody plants row crops. You know, they were, they were clearing things by hand, and that's more appropriate. Big crop, crop areas of cropping that, that turn, up, turn up the soil, it's, it's really not the right path. Yes? Um, just curious, uh, are they, when you say rural electrification, are, are you seeing generation on site, or are they building no. the grid? No, no, they're they're in the they're in the grid. And I probably should go through the slides as fast as possible because the projector's right. going to die, and then we'll take questions at the end. But yeah, I mean that's why they're talking about building these dams in the Amazon to provide electricity for uh, you know upgrading the standard of living of these people. 